well. So we have a series of outdoor ponds and raceways and indoor circulating buildings where we can uh, carry out a lot of that work. Um, we have a population dynamics crew that does a lot of um, acoustic telemetry. They do some modeling work and uh, feed a lot of data into our conservation efforts and fisheries management. We have a fish health unit that support hatchery operations throughout the Northeast through a, a fully kitted out diagnostics lab. So they have virology and bacteriology, uh, a lot of molecular science as well. And they also uh, use a lot of, uh, they do uh, it, um, wild fish health surveys throughout the Northeast as well. And so all of the work that we do at the center has a lot of federal partners, there's state partners, university partners, and also some NGO partners. Uh, we have various levels of public outreach, so we hold fishing events to um, get kids involved and in, you know, sort of build their enthusiasm in aquatic science. And of course we have the conservation genetics laboratory where, um, where I work. So. so a little bit about our conservation genetics laboratory. We have kind of two main areas that we work in. Um, the first one is population genetics. So we do a lot of the rootstock management um, for breeding programs for threatened and endangered species. So Atlantic salmon, pallid sturgeon. So this program really informs hatcheries on um, sort of their, their breeding and crossing of fish so that we can maintain genetic diversity in the fish that we're putting out for restoration efforts. Um, we also use that same sort of techniques within population genetics to do wild assessments of population structure. So knowing, knowing the population structure and whether one population of fish is, has gene flow between it and another population really informs how we approach the conservation of that species and the management of that species. Um, something that's newer at the facility is more of a molecular ecology. So that's kind of where I fit in. Um, we use two main techniques within our molecular ecology unit, and that would be um, quantitative PCR and next generation sequencing. So using some of our qPCR techniques, what we're doing is um, we kind of have a detection program where we can take a water sample and really tell you whether or not a fish has been in that area by detecting the DNA that's in the water. So that might be used for doing invasive species for sort of early detection, or we can also apply it to threatened endangered or any rare species that you may be interested in. So it's a powerful tool to really know whether or not the fish is there and present in the environment. Another thing that we work on quite a bit is mitochondrial genome sequencing. So that's really providing a lot of baseline genetic data that we use as reference material for doing some of our next generation sequencing. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And using that next generation sequencing, we can um, do a lot of biomonitoring. So this is where we look at um, more biodiversity kind of questions from eDNA. So for those of you that aren't really familiar with eDNA and um, so eDNA is, is literally the bits and pieces of DNA that organisms leave behind themselves in the environment. So this could be from a dead carcass in the water that's, that's decomposing. It could be, you know, intestinal cells that are fluffed, sloughed in feces or whatever. But all those bits and pieces end up in the environment. And those little snippets of DNA we can use to actually identify back to a species if we, if we can sequence them. So the idea is that, you know, if we can collect all the particles of DNA, those particles of DNA represent a species, and we can tell you what's in the water based on those particles that we collect. And that process of collecting that environmental DNA and making a species level designation based on it is called DNA metabarcoding. Okay, so um, conceptually it's pretty simple, but there's a lot of moving pieces to it. So obviously, we, the first thing we got to do is take a water sample. So that's usually about two liters of water. Um, that water gets filtered through about a one and a half micron pour filter. So we're just collecting, again, that particles out of the water. Um, from that, we extract the DNA from whatever we catch on the filter. And then it goes through a process of PCR amplification. And that's, that's where we're, we're targeting those little bits of DNA that represent, that are coming from the different fish species we're looking for. And we're, again, we're, we're amplifying them up. We're making multiple copies of those that we can then sequence. So they go through a, a library preparation stage, which is literally putting adapters and indexes on them to prepare them for sequencing. 
once they come off the sequencer, um, we get lots of them. And this is where we can actually read the genetic code, right? We can see the A's, the T's, the C's, and it's that variation in the genetic code that tells us the difference between one species to the next, right? But before we can do anything with it, when we get the sequencing reads, um, they're in a raw format. So there's still a lot of errors in them. There's low quality reads. So we have to do a lot of, a lot of preparation in here. So sorting them by index, merging reads, removing chimeras. There's a lot going on in there. Um, but once we have high quality reads, then we can, use, we can identify those reads. We can, we can either cluster them um, or we can actually identify each and every read against that reference database. So the reference database, again, goes back to where I was talking about mitochondrial DNA sequencing. So in the reference database here, um, we know what the DNA code is for each species. Right? So we're literally looking for what, from our environmental sample, matches that reference database. Right? And then once we're able to do that matching, then we can put it in some sort of format that's sort of understandable uh, for more people. And that's, you know, we have a list of species and the number of times we saw that sequence in the environment. So we have an idea of if they're present in the environment. So again, this is... Um, the number of sequencing reads, it does not necessarily equal number of fish in the environment. But it gives us an idea if they're there or they're not. And then once they're in this format, then they kind of resemble the account data that you have in ecology, and you can sort of use the relevant statistics like you would with um, our traditional kind of approaches. Right, so within our lab, we have no problem here. We can, uh, we can generate the sequence data with you know, like we have the sequencers, we have the genetics, geneticists with the expertise to do that. Um, we have fisheries biologists and ecologists that know what to do with it if we get it to here. The problem is in the middle there. So it's the bioinformatics step in the middle. And one of the problems there is when you run the sequencer, you end up with about 25 million reads a run, right? So you can multiplex a lot of samples on a sequencer, but we get a, a lot of data. So you can imagine 25 million runs by multiple runs, like, you know, it really builds up. And what do you do with all that data? And again, this is, it, it comes back to this being a really multidisciplinary thing. Like we've got geneticists involved, we've got the biologists and ecologists involved, and now in the middle here in this whole bioinformatics step, right, we need computer scientists, we need programmers, right? So that's where the CSU agreement comes into place. So we reached out to Penn State. Um, so Dr. Isvan Albert is a professor of bioinformatics at Penn State. We reached out to him and sort of posed our problem um, and asked if they're able to help. So in August of 2016, we we're able to finalize a CSU agreement with them to help us develop those bioinformatics capacities within our lab. So we set out with um, about six different goals, right? So one is the computational resources. We gotta find a way to really process all of that data and deal with all of that data. Um, we need a bioinformatics pipeline or workflow to, to deal with all that data, do all that trimming and quality assurance on all those sequences and get them in a position where we can actually make identifications. Um, we need to be able to produce a, a data output that's usable by our fish biologists and ecologists. And we have to be able to package that in a way that it's also accessible and usable by our geneticists who aren't, you know, first and foremost bioinformaticists, right? Um, we have to be able to do that in a Windows environment because unfortunately we, we're um, sort of our agency won't let us run Unix-based systems, but the world of bioinformatics runs in Unix. So we had to be able to translate that into Windows. And then we want to be able to do stuff that's, you know, of a high quality and that we can publish, right? So reaching out to Penn State, we were able to solve some of those. One, we moved things to a cloud service. So we were able to uh, harness the computable, computational resources of the cloud to do this. Um, the bioinformatics part, um, we have uh, Ashvedi Sebastian is a computational scientist in Isvan Albert's lab. So she's really stitching together all those basic Unix programs and building that workflow for us and generating an out output that we can use. Um, as far as getting that into a usable and accessible format, um, Nate Abera is working on that. So he's a, he's a programmer at Penn State. He's a recent um, Penn State graduate. 
And so he's designing an interface where we can sort of run these bioinformatic workflows through. And Nate's salary and his position are being supported through the CESU agreement. And he's also putting this together so that we can use it in the win Windows environment by making a web porthole. So this whole thing will run in the cloud. We'll have a login through the web to do that. So the project itself is in relatively early stages, but we do have a website up and running where we have the beginnings of the web porthole that we'll be using. Um, this is being designed specifically for us at the moment, but the idea is that this web porthole will serve a larger community that will be accessible to anybody doing metabarcoding work. So while we're doing metabarcoding specifically with fish, metabarcoding can be applied to microbes and invertebrates and soil um, nematodes or what, whatever you might be working on. So the, the whole pipeline can be adapted and is usable to a much, much wider community than just our, our particular office. So to facilitate that, obviously there's logons so that each person has an account and all the workflows are separate within it. So and click through a bit of the website, like I said, like bits and pieces of it are working, some parts aren't quite yet. So when you come on, you have project list, um, and then within any project list, um, you, can create, you can create a project. So when you create a project, you can go in and you can put in all the metadata associated with the project that you want and um, upload your data for that particular project where you, where you start. So I think if we go into good, what we went into here, uh, this, okay, so I'm going into analysis here. So we have a project in, if we go to our analysis, here we can see where we have our data, we can see what our data is. So if you were able to open that window, you could, you could see all the different data files that you've put in associated with that project and any of the metadata that's associated with those individual files. Um, and here we can run the analyses and view our results. So right now we don't have anything for the results window. So a lot of the bioinformatic pipeline is together and working. It just hasn't all been integrated into the web interface where we can view all of the pieces of it yet. Um, okay, so here's some of the analyses. So here we can generate some FASTQ files. So that's just a way to visualize the quality of your data before you even start a process. Um, we can trim the primers and do some of the quality, um, low quality base trimming. So again, that's that overall QC. We got to get our, our sequences in a format that we can use and that are reliable. And then performing that taxonomical um, classification so that we can see what, what species do we have, what did our sequences match in our database, All right? So this is what some of the, um, Data quality looks like so. This is a fast queue report. So again, this is an this is an external program that you can run on the web uh, to do fast queue. This is just being brought in and put within a framework where everything's in one place and a nice smooth workflow. Um, so you can run this before and after you do your quality quality assurance on all your um, sequences. And, and here we have. Uh, a site where we can go in and do more of that QC work. So we can um, upload our data, our sample file, and tell it how we want to process some of that data. And I think one of the innovative parts of what we're doing here is when you create a canned program like this, a lot of people will complain that they don't know what it's doing, right? You put data in, you get something out, you don't know what it did, right? So. Whenever you queue this up and you run anything within this, over here it generates all of the source code, right? So you can see exactly what it's doing and you can take that source code and move it somewhere else and use it again. So there's a complete log of everything that's happening as you go through a process. Um, so that's essentially where we're at at the moment. So um, I think once we have this up and running, though, it, it's going to be a resource that our office can use, the Fish and Wildlife Service can use, and the wider community can use to really get across that threshold of bioinformatics. Like I said, it's really multidisciplinary. We have geneticists working in the lab. We have fish biologists working in the field. And you have this whole like, really IT-intensive computer programming sector in the middle and helping bridge that community 
I think is really important and it will get a lot more people involved in using uh, meta barcoding and make it more accessible to the wider scientific community. So um, that's it. Thanks. Have any questions for Aaron? Hi, Diane Popic, National Park Service. Why is it a dot com? <laughs> That's a good question. That that was set up by um, Isfahan at Penn State, so I'm not sure why it's a dot com. I mean, metabarcoding.org is used somewhere else. I know that. So, are you are you wondering if they'll be making money off of it? Yeah. Is that the question? As far as I know, no. But I mean, I, those are questions and conversations that I think are important as we move forward, for sure. As this methodology develops, it, will you be able to do more than presence absence? Can you start to speculate you could get into population size, relative sizes? Yeah, and that's, that's certainly the hope. Um, as of right now, I'll tell you, yes, we can do presence absence. Um, we have done some experiments where we've compared um, electrofishing data that we get with uh, metabarcoding data. And it seems we've gotten really good correlations to relative abundance. Now, that said, we were working in relatively small um, salmonid streams that are, you know, they're small, they're clear, they're fast flowing. They're not a lot of diversity in them. So, you know, they may have 12 species in them. Um, I think in those streams, you have a lot better case for being able to do those things versus moving to a large lake system or a river system. So I think that the answer is going to be sometimes. You know, in the right system, I think, yes, we'll be able to do some of those more quantitative measures. Um, in larger systems, I think there's a, there's a lot to be learned yet, yeah. Other questions? Hello, uh, Jason Miller from Shepherd. How are you Thanks doing? for the interesting talk. I was thinking of two things. Um, first, I wonder if you're going to address reproducibility, which is a problem these days with bioinformatics mm. pipelines. By the time the paper's published, there's new versions of every piece of software in the pipeline. Right. Maybe you can somehow encapsulate everything that was done and make it available um, for people who want to reproduce what they read in the paper. And the second mm -hmm. question was, um, <clears throat> there's a whole ecosystem of these systems. There is. So yeah. there's Cyverse and there's KBase. And I wonder if you think about when this is ready to go integrating with others. Yeah, so... Um yeah, so there's a, a lot of the programs that are running in the background of this are tools that are out there, right? But all the tools that are out there, again, they run on Unix. They're, you know, uh, code-driven programs. And you might bounce from one program to the next to the next. And they change quite frequently, which makes it really difficult for somebody who's, you know, a geneticist trying to keep up on all that end of things to also be the bioinformaticist. So reaching out and having bioinformaticists help build this. And we're making sure that we're also using the best available stuff at the moment. But they can also go in and edit those things and change those things, right? So they can keep it up to date using the best available science that's running in the background. As far as transparency, that's where I was talking about here. Whenever, whenever this is going to run an analysis here, it generates all the source code to run that analysis. So it is transparent. You can see exactly what happened when you ran it. So if you want to go back a year later and re-queue that run, you have all of the source code that tells you exactly how that run was, was put together. Right? So that, that's something different than most, again, most CAN programs like this, you don't get that. So you don't know what it's doing in the background. Hi, Aaron. Mike, Mike Millard, uh, your lab. <laughs> so I should know this answer, but I don't. 
are you suggesting that if the Fish and Wildlife Service let us use Unix, that the software already exists such that this agreement wouldn't have been needed? Or is there something else that, about this that we would need this anyway? <clears throat> um, that's part of it. I, that the, the, yes, we could put this all on our machines and run it in Unix without Penn State. The problem is that well, there's limited bioinformatics experience by most of our staff, including me, right? So I'm not a person that's going to sit down and write all the Write, write all the command line code and little Python programs to stitch it all together, right? If I had that skill, then no, we don't, we wouldn't have to go outside to do that. But again, within Fish and Wildlife Service, as far as I know, we don't really have people with those skills at all within the service. So um, again, that's where I think reaching out to, to a university and being able to partner with the university provides, you know, access to those skill sets that we don't have within the service. So thank you for that presentation. I just want to make the point of that how not only did we invite this presentation because they're doing really cool research, but talk about a textbook example of what the CESU ought to be doing, the role it ought to be playing, of a federal partner who has all kinds of expertise, but they're missing one key link to get their and for whatever institutional reason, whether it happens, happens to be the software they're allowed to use or more important, likely um, the personnel, the, the people power, the, the, the expertise, they're missing a key link. How many years would it take to create a new position you know, and to try to get it filled? And in the meantime, the research you know, is slowed down. Uh, but if you have a quick, efficient way of making a contract with somebody who has that expertise at a university partner, non-federal partner within our network, boom, you can do it you know, within a few months or a year or so. And so now all of a sudden, your team is enriched by somebody who has that ex expertise that that federal partner in that particular situation doesn't have. So I want to thank you not only for telling us educating us a lot about some cool research and breaking, you know, cutting edge re research, but um, also demonstrating how important this, the role that the CESU can play. Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm very excited about this. Um, is your intention to have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service maintain the database over time, or is this going to be housed at Penn State? It it strikes me that it it's a large partner based database. Um, I'm just curious is, about that. Are, are are you referring to the database by which we make our um, species identifications based on? Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, who will maintain this? network uh, or this, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, the, the right. website who, who or who? Will, who will continually update and maintain the bioinformatic tools that are being built into it. Thank you, yes. Yeah, that, that, would be, that would be Penn State, yeah. I mean, again, they have the technical expertise to, to sort of maintain that and continue to develop it. Okay, so when I, I log in and up, upload all my data, they will maintain that? Yes. Okay. I'm just, I'm wondering, we've run into issues in the Forest Service where we have these huge databases and we run out of funding to maintain them maintain and we it. disagree on who should be doing that job mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. just bringing that up, I guess. Yeah, it, it's also envisioned that this will be like, um, you won't necessarily always have to upload your data, that you'll be able to download the program itself and run a local version on your own, own machine, okay. right? So. Um, that'll get around some of those data security issues where they don't want you to upload your data or use a cloud service, but you'll be able to pull that down and use that. Um, the large reference databases for fish ID, a lot of that's pulled from um, places like GenBank, which are federally supported repositories of genetic information now. So like this system literally pings GenBank every quarter or something and downloads a set of sequences to update itself. 
right? So the, you know, and then you can create you create custom databases of your own if you want as well. But, you know. Okay, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Malloy. We appreciate it. So just two quick announcements. Um, I forgot to mention my update. I was so excited about uh, all the research. Um, so uh, we are targeting June 8th of next year for our next annual meeting. Um, and we're looking at potentially NCTC, which is not far from here, um, mainly because of its central location. So if you could all write down June 8th, I want to see some pens move so you can block that date off so you're here next year. People on the phone, block it off so you can be here in person next year. Um, I'll follow up with that. Um, we're also going to send a survey out this fall, kind of a satisfaction survey, see how you're doing out there. Maybe get, if you have some ideas about some ways you'd like to see things done better in the CESU, if you want me to get canned, we can give that information to Eric and he can find somebody else. Um, but we will also ask uh, about that date, okay? So just remember June 8th. Um, and I'd like to lastly thank Shepherd University. I'm Bob, if you have any closing remarks you wanted to share since you were con so kind. Okay, so thanks to Shepherd and thanks to everyone. Oh, you do? Okay. Where, where can we meet? Oh. <laughs> uh, go out this door and go that way, and there's uh, 12 different restaurants right there. Right on the main drive. Yeah. Okay. okay. So th thanks again to everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for those who agreed to present. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, and the federal partners should be back. Oh, yeah. The federal partners who are participating in the afternoon meeting should be back at 1.30. 1.30. 1.35. Uh, we'll see around a little bit over 1.35. Five. All right, thanks. Some are dreamers, some are doers, and just a few are both. That's the heartbeat of Shepherd University, a quality education that's within reach. In fact, we're one of the most affordable schools in the nation. Whether you're just starting off or you're ready for a new start, Shepherd University, don't just dream, do.